Hey, Jonathan here at Colfax Math. I teach math in Woodshop and I was a building contractor before I taught. Today I'm going to go over the Carpenter's Apprenticeship Math pre-exam and my theory is um, I would just stop the video, try and do the one problem yourself and then I'll do it afterwards and you could check your work. I won't do every problem, I'll probably do every other problem, but I'll try and cover every idea. So hopefully this will help. I'll just put the camera over my shoulder. Um, I'll give you a second to do the problems, you know, pause the video and then watch how I do them. And then I also have a few test taking strategies as well I'll go over. And I'll put a link to this practice exam in the description below. Okay, I hope this helps. Hopefully um, this will help you pass the exam and become a... All right, before we get started on the Carpenter Apprenticeship Math pretest, let me just go over my five test taking strategies. Number one, be prepared. Search the internet for what um, the test is going to look like. Is it going to be multiple choice? You got, have to write long answers. See if you could sign some videos on the test, just like this one. Um, so there you go. You're already one step ahead. So number one, be prepared. Number two, arrive early to take the test. Make sure you get there early. You plan it all out. Um, and you're able to relax before you start sitting down to take the exam. Number three, as soon as the test starts, write down key formulas and ideas on scratch paper. So that'll really help you a lot. Oh, misspelled there. Um, so if you knew that circumference is equal to two pi r, write that down on your scratch paper as soon as the test starts. And that way, when you get to a problem that requires something like that, um, you know, you might forget it and you'll go right back to your reference note and you'll be able to see it right there and refer to it and not make a mistake. Number four, read the directions very carefully, circling important ideas in directions and note the time. So make sure you're spending the right amount of time on the problem. So if you got a 60 minute test, 60 problems, never spend more than about a minute on a problem. Um, just because the hardest problem on there is the same weight as the easiest problem on there. So you don't want to miss a bunch of easy problems because you run out of time because you spend so much time on a, a hard problem you might not get anyway. And then lastly, mark up the test with a pencil and circling key points. If the problem is 3.01 plus 5.2, well, the point of this problem is to line up your decimal point. So 3.01, 5.2, I feel like I spent enough time on this problem. So I move on, but when I go back, I already have all my work there. So I don't have to start the problem all over again. So that's my number five point. Mark up the test with your pencil, show all your work in an organized fashion. So if you go back to it, you don't have to start all over again. And it's also easy to check your work. All right, so let's go ahead and get started on the carpenter apprenticeship math pretest. I won't do every one of these problems. I'll kind of do every other one, but it'll give you an idea on how to do the problems. Okay, number one here is add the following numbers. The point of this problem is really keeping all your rows lined up perfectly. So 14, 108, 10, 27, and six, and 339. I'll go ahead and do that first. And then I'm gonna add this first column. 4 plus 8, 12, 19, 19 and 6, 25, 34. I carry the 3 up, staying pretty organized here. 4, 6, 9, 1, 0, and 3 is 4, 14, 94. So there's answer 1. Number 2. Uh, is adding decimals. The key here is I line up all my decimal points and then I add them all up. There are no places here. That gives me 117.651. 1, 1, Number three is 1026 from 2003. So I have 2003 minus 1026. Forgot my pauses. So three minus six, I can't do that. So I got to borrow from here. There's nothing to borrow from. So I got to borrow from here, nothing to borrow from. So I got to borrow a thousand. So I borrow a thousand from here. This two becomes a one. 
this zero becomes a 10. So 10 hundred is the equivalent of a thousand. Then from this 10, I borrow one. That makes it a nine. That gives me a 10 here. Now I'm able to borrow one from here. That makes this a nine and a 13. So what I'm saying is 1,990 and 13 is equal to 2,003. Now I could do 13 minus six to give me seven, nine minus two, seven, nine minus zero, nine, one minus one, zero. So I'm saying 977 plus 1026 is 2003. Number four, again, is a decimal. I'll skip this one, but line up the decimal point and subtract. And again, you're gonna have to borrow from here. Number five, 43 times seven. You do seven times three, 21, carry the two. Seven times four, 28, plus that two to get 3301. Okay, so that's that first page. Let's move on to the next page. Multiply 1137 by 56. You would do that kind of the same way. Okay, I think I'll skip that one. Move on to number seven. If you see how I do seven, um, it'll, six will make sense. So seven is multiply 11.007 by 108.2. So with multiplication and division of decimals, I do not line the decimal points up. I keep track of it. My final answer is gonna be one, one two, three, four points in. Okay, so I'm gonna do this like a long division. So I do two times this whole thing. Then I bump over one, eight times that whole thing. Bump over one, zero times that whole thing, bump over one. So it's really important to stay pretty orderly that your columns are lined up. So two times seven is 14. Carry the one, two times zero is zero, plus one is one. 2 times 0, 2 times 1, 2 times 1. I move over on my next one down. So now I'm going to do 8 times that whole thing. 8 times 7 is 56. I'm going to put the 5 up here. 8 times 0 is 0 plus 5. 8 times 0, 8 times 1. 8 times 1. I'm going to put that 0. 0 times anything. These are all zeros. And now I'm finally at the 1. And I'm going to do 1 times 7. 1 times 0. You can tell I'm pretty organized here. 1 times 0. 1 times 1. 1 times 1. I'm going to add all these up to get 4. 7, 0, and 5, 9, 10. So there's 10, carry the 1, 9, a 1, and a 1. Like I was saying, I count over how many decimal places the total is. So it's over 1, 2, 3, 4. So I start here, I go 1, 2, 3, 4. And that's my answer right there. See if that even makes sense. 108 times 10 would be like 1,000, and I'm in the 1,000 range, so I could see it makes sense. All right. Um, let's see here. Let me do another one, a division one here. I'll, I'll do this 1064 by 8. So this is this problem. You know, pause it, do it yourself first. 1064 divided by 8, 1064 divided by 8, so 8 goes into 10 one time, 10 minus 8 is 2, bring down the 6, 8 goes into 26 three times to give you 24, 26 minus 24, 2, bring down the 4, 8 goes into 24, 8 goes into 24 three times. Let's see if that makes sense. What I'm saying is, 1,064 divided by 8 is 133. 
So that should mean 133 times 8 is 1,064. And that kind of makes sense because 8 times 100 is 800 plus 240 or so. So I can see that one's right. I'll skip that decimal division there. And I'll move on to fractions, number 10. Add the following fractions, a quarter, an eighth, three sixteenths, and a half. So the key on adding and subtracting fractions is the denominator has to be the same in all of them. So you gotta have a common denominator in all the fractions. So here, the common denominator is 16, the biggest number. So how do I get one fourth to have a 16 in the bottom? I multiply it by four over four. So that one quarter is the same as four sixteenths. That one eighth is the same as two sixteenths. Three sixteenths I don't have to find the equivalent of. And then one half, I multiply that by eight over eight to get eight sixteenths. So this is my quarter, this is my eighth, three sixteenths and a half. Now they all have that common denominator. So I add across the top and keep that bottom number. So four and two is six, plus three is nine, plus eight is 17. So my answer is 17 sixteenths. That numerator is larger than the denominator. So 16 will go into 17 one time with one left over. Let's see, one, one sixteenth. So 17 sixteenths or one and one sixteenths. Okay, let's do another one. I have a half. Man, it's hard to see. I have one fourth. Divide the following fractions. One fourth by one half. So a fourth divided by a half. This is kind of a funny algorithm. The way you do this, the way you divide fractions is you keep the first fraction the same and then you reciprocate or flip over the second fraction and you multiply. So one quarter times two over one is the way you do one quarter divided by a half. And that would give you two fourths. Two goes into two one time and into here. So what I'm saying is a quarter divided by a half is equal to a half. The reverse of that would be one half times one half equals a quarter. Divide three sixteenths, divide three sixteenths by one eighth. So again, I'm gonna do three sixteenths times eight over one. This problem's more about canceling. So eight will go into here one time, eight will go into here two times, and it'll give me three halves three in the numerator, two in the denominator, three halves. And as a mixed number, that would be one and one half, because two goes into three one time with one left over out of two. So again, dividing fractions is multiplying by the reciprocal. All right, so this kind of our arithmetic part. Let's move on to some angles. A right triangle contains one angle of 46 degrees. So I do this a lot better if I have a picture. A right triangle means one angle is 90. One of the angles is 46 degrees. All three angles add up to 180, but this one's 90. This is right, that little box means 90 degrees. So that means these two together are 90. So I do 90 minus 46 to get 44 degrees. So the answer is 44 degrees. It's called complementary, two angles that add to 90. Back to equivalencies and fractions, convert 5 eighths to a decimal. Give you a second to do that. You could, I think of the fraction falling over this way and I'm doing eight into five. What well, doesn't go into five, so that doesn't go into zero. So this is the same as 5.0. So I bring that decimal point up. Eight goes into 50 um, six times to give me 48. Bring down the two, bring down the zero. Eight goes into 20 twice, give me 16. Four, bring down the zero. Eight goes into 45 times. A lot of people know those equivalents. That a quarter 
is equal to 0.25. So an 8 is equal to half of that, 0.125. And then I have five of those 8s, or 0.625. Okay. The number of millimeters in a meter, it's a metric conversion. Um, Milli just means a thousand, so there's a thousand millimeters in a meter, a hundred centimeters in a meter, ten decimeters in a meter, and then one. Number 17, one imperial gallon. That's not really a math problem, that's just a retention problem. You just need to know that one, I guess. I don't really know what that has to do with carpentry. I mean, I don't know, maybe you're painting a house in France or some metric, I don't know. Um, anyway, there's 4.54 liters equal a gallon. Not really a math problem, just something you gotta memorize. All right, moving on to the next page. Carpenter cuts three pieces from a 12 foot length of two by six. The length of the pieces are 33 and three eighths, 56 and five eighths, 39 and seven eighths. So I haven't even really started on this problem. I'm just writing out what I have. What is left over from the full length? The saw curve is an eighth. So I guess I'm starting with 12. I cut that piece and that's gonna also be an eighth more. So 33, I'm going to change that to 4 eighths to include that kerf width. Then I cut my next piece, it's 56 and 5 eighths. I'm going to change it to the 6 eighths. And I'm not going to reduce that 6 eighths because I'm going to be adding these fractions up anyway. And then I cut this piece at 39 and 7 eighths, which is going to make this 39 and 8 eighths. Right, 39 and 8 eighths is 1. So that's just going to be 40. Okay, so I have my saw curve in there. Um, let me add these up. 4 eighths and 6 eighths is 10 eighths. I'm going to reduce that fraction in a minute. Grab a sharper pencil. And add these numbers up. 3 and 6 is 9. 3 and 5 is 8. 12. So I got 129 and 10 eighths. 10 eighths is a whole inch. So that's going to be 130 and 2 eighths. So that's the total cut board added together, including the three kerf. So then I have a 12 foot board. This two by six right here is actually unrelated. So I have a 12 foot board. This is inches. 12 times 12 is 144 inches minus 130 and 130, two eighths is a quarter, a quarter inch. So now I gotta subtract this from this. I'm actually gonna borrow one inch here. So I'm gonna borrow one of these inches. This is now gonna be 143 inches and four fourths of a quarter, All right? So four quarters gives me the 144. So four quarters minus one quarter is three quarters. 143 minus 130 is 13. So my answer is 13 and three quarters of an inch. All right, let's keep going. You might want to pause and take a nap. I'm putting myself to sleep here. Right, so again, I'm going to draw a picture. 4.5 feet. That's kind of a trick. This is a key. Area of a circle is equal to pi r squared. I don't have radius. I have diameter, so I gotta cut that in half. So this is equal to 2.25, right? Now that I have that radius, my area is equal to pi 2.25 squared. I gotta do exponents before multiplication. So I take that number, I multiply it by itself, multiply it by pi, and that gives me my area. All right, let's 
Let's keep going. What's the area of a right triangle having a base of three feet? Again, I gotta draw a picture. Three feet and a height of four feet. Make sure I keep my units in there. Area of a right triangle. So area of a triangle is base times height divided by two or 12 divided by two, six square feet. All right. Surface area of a box. Surface area of a box is gonna be all six faces added together. So I'm gonna do 36 times 78. That'll be this face. And then I have two of those. And then if this is 78, this is 78. These are all inches. So then this face is 36 times 78. And then I got two of them times two. And then this top here is 78 times 78 times the top and the bottom times two. And then I take those numbers. I forgot we're in the calculator department now. All right, so it was, if we go back here to the first page, do not use calculator for one through 13. All right, so I'm gonna go 36 times 78 times two, 56, 16. 36 times 78 times two, 56, 16. 78 times 78 times two, 12,168. Then I'm gonna add all three of those together. So I'm gonna take that number, so it takes my previous answer plus 5616 plus 5616 gives me 23,400 answer in square inches. These are all inches squared. That's my answer there. All right. Calculate the volume. That's actually how much stuff can actually go in that thing. Again, I don't know if you can read this, but diameter is 1.3 meters. So I do 1.3 divided by two. So my radius is 0.65 meters. I gotta find the area of that circle. Area is pi r squared. So the area of this base is pi times 0.65 squared. So over here on my calculator, I'm gonna go 0.65 times 0.65 equals times pi. There's actually a button on here, that little blue one right there is pi times pi. And that gives you the area of this bottom circle. So the area of that bottom circle is 1.327. And then volume is that base area times height. And I think that's 2.8. I actually keep that value on my calculator and I multiply it by the 2.8 of the height and I get 3.716. All right. Take a breather if you want to pause that. I want some Netflix. All right, what's 12% of 63? The way I take this 12%, convert it to a decimal, I view this thing like an arrow, and it takes it and knocks it over two places. So 12% is 0 0.12 times 63. I just entered that on my calculator, 0 0.12 times 63. All right, more, find the square. Should I do more percents? I feel like I'm putting everybody to bed here. Um, I'll just skip down here. Find the square of 11. That's saying 11 squared or 121. Find the cube of five. So that's saying five cube is three. So it's five cubed. 
So it's 5 times 5 times 5. 5 times 5 is 25. 125. And then a root is saying, what's the square root of 49? This is the opposite. This is going for this times itself three times, or this times itself. And this is saying what times what equals 49. So this would be what times itself is 49. That'd be a 7. All right, finally our last page. Find the cube root of 216. So that's saying what what times what times itself three times equals 216. 5 would be 5, 125. 6 times 6, 36. Times 6 is 216. So the answer here is 6. Uh, right, 16% is a decimal. So again, you just bump that over to get 0.16. And also it's a fraction. So that is 16 parts of 100. Reduced to lowest form, that would be the same as 8 over 50. It's cutting it in half. 4 over 25. No number will go into either one of those. So that's as far reduced as it'll go. Well, I tell you what, I know I did this in Carpenter. Convert a million to scientific notation. So that's going to be a 1.0 times 10 to some power. The decimals here, it goes over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 1.0 times 10 to the 6 would be this scientific notation. Going backwards, again, this is 1.0 times 10 to some negative number. That would be negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 10 to the negative 5 would be that number in scientific notation. And hallelujah, the last problem. Number 36, the square root of 16. Go ahead, and, this is actually about order of operations. Square root of 16 is, is what times itself equals 16, so that's four. Plus, I gotta do my parentheses first, nine plus 16, 25 squared. 25 squared is 625. Four plus 625 is 629. And that's it. That's it. I mean, hopefully that was a good review and that helped you. Um, hopefully this camera worked okay. Um, I hope that helped you. So thank you for watching. If you, I'd like to hear your comments below. Again, this test is, um, there's a link to this test. And then there's a key at the end as well. So, all right, that's a carpenter apprenticeship math pre-test. Good luck. Go slow. Don't make careless mistakes. Just like building a house.